afternoon. Hello, uh, welcome to Houston, and welcome to our cardiovascular fellows boot camp. I would just inform that we have a uh, mixture of audience here, uh, from cardiologists to uh, the surgical team as well, and anesthesia. Can I just have a raise of hand? How many of you are from anesthesia? Oh my goodness, we have a great core. Okay, and uh, surgery? And cardiology? Stellar. Okay. Um, I think you will really uh, uh, have an um, amazing uh, next two and a half days as you go through the complex and yet amazing world of cardiovascular uh, uh, interventions, treatment, care plan, and, and getting to know that in so many different ways as the program has is designed to do. Um, the next, uh, this session is geared towards heart failure, and my name is Dr. Myung Park. I'm the chief of heart failure division in, uh, in Houston Methodist, and I am joined by uh, my colleagues, and what we hope to do is carry you through um, things from chronic heart failure management to acute, surgical, and also uh, touch upon some pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure as well. So it's gonna be a whirlwind, it's gonna be fast. What we hope to do is, is get you acquainted with the terminology and, and the um, uh, essentials, if you will, uh, for everyday practice and also for your boards, which I know for some of you that's coming up. So uh, without any further ado, uh, let me introduce Dr. Jerry Step. Uh, he is uh, uh, well known in the state of Texas and beyond. He is a, a section head for uh, transplant and mechanical support, and he's gonna carry you through cardiogenic shock. Okay, del delighted to be here and delighted you're here. And so this is um, supposed to be, meant to be an overview. And what I wanna do is just focus in on, as mentioned, some terminology, but exposure, expose you to the different device options that we have. And cardiology is an exciting time, especially in the era of mechanical circulatory support because of improvements in technology. And Dr. Gu is gonna comment on these permanent VADs really focusing in on the short-term devices, and here's my, are my disclosures. So what I'd like to do is just provide an update on shock. I'll give you a working definition, which I think is very straightforward, but really focus in on short-term mechanical devices that can be placed percutaneously. So I'm not gonna focus in on the surgical short-term devices, and really put this in perspective as which device for which patient, um, device strategies and ultimate goals of care that should be focused in on. When you, when you have shock, in my mind, it's, it's fairly straightforward. The symptoms of low output or perfusion with clinical congestion. So the hemodynamic criteria is a cardiac index, less than 2.2 liters per minute squared, or in, in the setting of a wedge that's high. The pump is failing. Now, usually patients manifest clinically. They can have altered sensorium. They may have cold extremities. Kidneys start to struggle. They have poor urine output. And when you see patients with well, even if it's relative hypotension, but certainly with blood pressures less than 90 in the setting of tachycardia, some of them may be pacemaker dependent, may not mount a tachycardia, that's, that's shock. And I think to differentiate, I'm not gonna spend time going over septic shock or other forms of shock, hypovolemic shock, but a Swangans catheter, in my mind, is key, not only to corroborate your clinical exam findings, but to help tailor the therapy and understand if your management is working. So that's gonna be concept number one, have a swan in when you're dealing with shock. So here's a list of common e reasons why patients develop shock. Post in my shock has been probably perhaps the best studied. The most poorly studied is acute on chronic progressive heart failure. And we certainly know that this is not a negligible reason for patients to be in the hospital in terms of burden, number of patients, and how sick they can be. But we go through this list in terms of myocarditis, transplant rejection if they've had a history of heart transplant, valvular disorder certainly, and then others as, as listed here. Now, I think it's easy to understand that those that are the most extreme form of shock, and I would say severe refractory cardiogenic shock, multiple pressures on the vent, kidney failure, liver failure, their in-hospital mortalities can be in excess of 80%. I would argue that there is a spectrum of shock. In patients that are inotrope dependent but start failing, we call that Intermax 2. These patients, their in-house prognosis, let alone one-year prognosis, can be poor. And what I want to highlight with this slide is that we don't take patients either in the extreme state, severe refractory shock, um, to permanent LVAD or major thoracic surgery, is their survival 
is compromised, perioperative survival. So I think around the country it is fair to say that patients presenting in the most extreme form were pursuing short-term device for optimization. So this just highlights that severe hemodynamic instability is not the right patient for general anesthesia, let alone a, a, a major implant like a permanent LVAD. And I've listed other contraindications. So let's get to the nuts of the, and bolts of the talk, if you will. How many have been exposed to balloon pump? So vast majority, if not everybody. What about one of the three impella devices or four devices? Raise your hand. So Abimed, certainly we know by market share at least, has is, is, is acquired a significant in terms of utilization. Tandem heart by cardiac assist, a few. And ECMO, central peripheral ECMO. ECMO. So balloon pump, much like is the case in this room, is probably the most commonly used device for a variety of e reasons in terms of its ease of access. And it is um, actually indicated for both ischemic and non-ischemic in terms of complications of, of heart failure. And here's the breakdown of, of indications, but in our world with heart failure, it's acute on chronic heart failure presenting with low output symptomatology. Not all balloons are created equal. We have these seven French sensational balloons to these linear balloons. These you can uh, accurately measure blood pressure by a uh, by the, the technology uh, embedded within the balloon as opposed to having be dependent on an arterial port. But the concept is that a bigger balloon can offer more support. So when we're serious about it, it's a 50 cc balloon. And we do understand size limitations where we perhaps have to use a 40 cc balloon. Balloon pumps, we know, augment diastolic blood pressure, they minimize afterload, they can improve coronary flow. These are all very good in the setting of either ischemic or non-ischemic. And tomorrow we're going to spend a lot of time deconstructing the balloon pump troubleshooting in the context of dysrhythmias, troubleshooting in the context of a code. Um, but a balloon pump can help us, is what I would argue. Now the reality is there's a paucity of data on the efficacy and side effect in this patient population. I think balloon pumps have stood the test of time as it relates to a low risk profile in terms of bleeding uh, complications. But when you take a step back and look at how balloon pump has been studied in the setting of high risk PCI and cardiogenic shock, you can appreciate that compared to medical management, no difference. And balloon pumps really have fallen off in terms of utilization. We are using axillary balloon pump, and I mentioned this to, to highlight what I think is the horizon, where we can place a, a standard balloon in the axillary subclavian artery by a percutaneous technique. The balloon pump's simply upside down, and patients can sit up and ambulate. And this is helpful, and we've been using this as a strategy for stability in some, bridge to transplant, or for optimization prior to LVAD. So we've done this now in a little over 100 patients, closer to 120. And so this adoption is, is I think, catching on. So more to come in terms of its efficacy. This is our post-transplant efficacy, and it has looked very, very good. But the concept is extended, extended balloon support can help not only underlying hemodynamics, but can help end organ perfusion. And so here is before and after implantation related to more than three days use of balloon pump with improvement in creatinine and total bilirubin. And I think that's a real concept. If you were to ask me what degree of augmentation you get in terms of cardiac output percent increase, at most 25%. You'll be seeing coming up published data along these lines. This is our own internal uh, data. And what we're seeing is also improvement in kidney function. But again, the concept of extended balloon pump support more than just 24 hours. Here are the impella devices, the 259 French internal diameter, CP40, 14 French internal diameter. And our workhorse in the setting of more overt shock, the impella 50, which is a 21 French um, diameter. That mandates the use of uh, graft to put it in the LV to unload. Taking a step back, data supporting the Impella device is as listed here from PCI-related uh, uh, studies to registry to single center experience review. I think it's very fair to say compared to the balloon pump, the Impella, even, even the 2 offers significant hemodynamic support compared to the balloon pump in terms of cardiac index augmentation. You look at the degree of augmentation, it's around 28% on average. It could be higher for an individual patient, but you do get an improvement in, uh, uh, also in blood pressure. So it does offer more support than a blood pressure. The CP and Impella 50 in particular can offer augment, cardiac output augmentation as high as 56%, wedge reduction as high as 40%, with an improvement in mean blood pressure. So it's a much more robust pump, and we have the capability to dial in the degree of support Here's a patient on Impella 5.0, and I can decrease the revolutions per minute 
and this patient has a blood pressure of 64, wedge of 27, and instantaneously augment blood pressure to 81 millimeters of mercury and reduce wedge and improve flow. This is a flow estimate, but cardiac output would increase. So it's a very robust pump. What's nice about the Impella devices in its reduction in LVEDP, minimization of wall tension, improvement in coronary perfusion, which has been documented in the case series, you're, you're improving the supply demand perhaps as a strategy for recovery in, in patients. What's nice and the goal is to try to wean off the inotropes and or pressors, which we know challenge that heart and increase wall tension. And this has been demonstrated in acute on chronic heart failure and in the post-cardiotomy state. I think lactic concentrations should be me measured in, in shock. And when you have lowering lactic acid levels, that's a sign of improvement in perfusion and a sign of improving the, the overall state for the liver, kidney, and the brain and for your patient. So the, here's the Impella 5.0, Dacron 10 millimeter graft placed into the ascending, then into the LV. There's the positioning by x-rays. And again, patients can sit upright and ambulate. Only one recent trial comparing, in particular, the CP versus the balloon with a mortality endpoint. Very challenging patient population to study. Um, there was no difference in mortality, but nearly half of these patients were, one can argue, poor candidates, anoxic encephalopathy, uh, really overt end organ failure. So the jury's still out in my mind in terms of the role of CP versus balloon, at least as it relates to survival advantage. Right now, there is no data to suggest that. So the guidelines are evolving. Uh, last updated in 2013, I can tell you that the HFSA, uh, working with uh, uh, interventional societies like TCT, um, or looking to better define the role of ECHO, just to give you the updated FDA indication for the Impella devices. For the Impella 2.5 and CP, up to use to four days, and for the, for the Impella 5.0, um, up to six days. And we are still um, extending support in select patients beyond that with the concept of improving the heart. Now, in, in given the time, I'm coming up at a few minutes, started a few minutes late. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on tandem or um, ECMO, as you all highlighted, these are less common. The tandem can offer just as robust support as the Impella 5.0. It's a centrifugal pump that sits on the, I'll go back, sits on the outside of the body. You draw from oxygenated blood from the left atrium, cross a transeptal puncture, and reperfuse via the iliac artery system. And very robust on loading in terms of wedge reduction and augmentation of of flow, limited data regarding the role of tandem heart compared to the Impella devices. Compared to Balloon, we know certainly it offers more support. But the real issue in my mind is creating an atrial septal defect and the risk for LA thrombus. And so it requires more percutaneous skill set, a higher degree of percutaneous skill set. Peripheral AV ECMO is the most robust. You can add, with an oxygenator and, and a pump, you can take um, deoxygenated blood from the right atrium and deliver it to the iliac system, similar to the tandem, but, but from the right atrium versus left atrium, but you can improve gas exchange. Now, a concept is, is as you increase ECMO support, LV EDP will increase. So you must vent the LV to re reduce pulmonary edema, to reduce complications considering an exit strategy. So many centers like ours couple peripheral AV ECMO with a balloon or with an impeller device to mitigate that increase in LV EDP that can be seen at higher levels of support. ECMO is a real challenge in terms of what it may mean in terms of severity of illness for that particular patient. And when you look at post-transplant or post-LVAD outcome where ECMO was used as a bridge, it is not as ideal as we would like. Now, this slide highlights that, and you see the difference in the Kaplan marker, blue versus red. So it's certainly a challenge. So this is one of the take-home slides. As you increase device support in terms of augmentation of flow, it's bigger cannula, more bleeding, more leg ischemia. You must go through this contraindication list. You have a mechanical way or your valve going across the valve is contraindicated. Significant AI is contraindicated for balloon pump. Left atrial clot or severe, per, per, ser, severe peripheral vascular disease is a contraindication for any device where we're going through the growing. So this continues to evolve. And so this is the treatment algorithm. I think at our institution, using balloon pump early, monitoring with swan GANs, following end organ perfusion, and escalating to higher support if needed. And I'm going to show you two more slides to end. And that really is highlighted here. This is our algorithm. Our team is heart failure cardiologists and our thoracic surgeon. We have a robust LVAD transplant program. 
we have severe refractory shock with overt hypoxia, acidemia, we're thinking peripheral AV ECMO with a vent. If it's left end or right side of heart failure from left side of heart failure, balloon pump, interval subsequent analysis in the order of a few hours, based on urine output, hemodynamics, lactic acid levels, we will augment to an Impella 5 One can consider an Impella CP. But you must have an exit strategy. Are you bridging this to recovery? In an end-stage heart failure profile, it's really as a bridge to bridge, to permanent LVAD or to transplant. In some, their candidacy remains poor and you pursue palliative care. So a team approach is key to put this in perspective. I would highlight tailored degree of hemodynamic support to the, to the type of device and to the patient profile, which will guide you. I think that this continues to evolve. Here's the consent, latest consensus statement for you to review from the societies. And protocols, being familiar with one or two devices, having the full armamentarium while helpful, being an expert in one or two, my mind's better, and understanding the trajectory. I appreciate your attention. Happy to take any questions. Thank you.